From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics editor Ted Nisi. And joining us this week on Newsmakers is candidate for U.S. Representative in the 2nd Congressional District, Seth Magaziner, a.k.a. General Treasurer, we should point out. I think people at home know that by now. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So, uh, Treasurer, as many people know, you were running for governor then left that race to jump into the election to replace Congressman Jim Langevin. And many people might come away from that thinking you're a political opportunist who just wants whatever seat you think you have a best shot at winning. Why should people feel differently? Well, my guiding principle throughout my time in public service has been how can I best deliver positive results for Rhode Islanders? And that's why I'm running for Congress. When uh, Jim Langevin unexpectedly announced his retirement, uh, I knew that this was the way that I could best deliver results for working people in the state. We need representation in Washington um, that knows how to get things done, cut through the nonsense, and deliver real results. So on um, things like lowering the cost of living, people are worried about inflation. People are worried about their kids' quality of their education. They're worried about what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. And what I bring to the table in this race and what I will bring to Congress is a track record of showing that I can deliver results on big economic issues having led a statewide school construction program, having managed the pension fund to a record high, having uh, created clean energy projects across Rhode Island that put a lot of people to work. And nothing would set back the cause of working people in Rhode Island more, in my view, than if uh, Kevin McCarthy and Marjorie Green and the crazies from the far right in Washington take over Congress again because their agenda is to do things like repeal the Affordable Care Act and privatize Social Security, things that would hurt working people in Rhode Island. So everything that I've done is through the lens of how can I best deliver results for working people in Rhode Island. That's why I'm in this race for Congress and that's why I look forward to representing Rhode Island in Washington. At last check, um, at your campaign announcement, you, you lived in Providence, which is in the first congressional district. You said you would move to the second congressional district. Where does that stand? Well, that's still the plan. And uh, listen, I lived in the second district for several years, voted in the second district. I have a track record of state treasurer delivering an impact and positive results across all of District 2. In the last seven years as state treasurer, I have spent time in every community in the second congressional district, listening to people's concerns, working with people to solve problems, and having an impact. The school construction program that I spearheaded is building new elementary schools in Cranston and Johnston and repairing schools in Warwick. The clean energy projects, uh, programs that I started at the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank have put people to work in West Warwick and Westerly and helped small businesses and nonprofits across the district become more energy efficient. But as part of that so, plan, when, when when are you moving to the second district? It'll be before the primary, after the primary? So we're actively looking now. It's a difficult housing market, as you know. And not so for a seller. It's not, uh, <laughs> well, for a buyer it is. And so it's, um, it's, uh, it's not entirely in our control uh, what the timing is, but uh, we are committed to doing it. Again, I've lived in the district before. I've served the district and represented the district as state treasurer for seven years. And I think people in the second district know that I can deliver results and I can be an effective Have you voice. picked a town? We're looking in a few different towns, yeah. And, and uh, people know, in the 2nd District know that I can be an effective voice for them in Washington because I have been an effective voice for them as state treasurer over the last seven years. Last update I got from your campaign, uh, they said you'd raised over $750,000 uh, in a short period of time, a large amount of money. I, I assume you are the financial leader in the race, so of course we don't have everyone's reports. One of your rivals, Ed Pacheco, dropped out of the race this week, and he alluded to that money saying, quote, this experience signals to me the need for campaign finance reform, mm -hmm. leveling the playing field for everyday Americans to participate in our democracy. Do you agree? Yes. I mean, listen, first of all, I'm very um, proud and humbled by the fact that already hundreds of Rhode Islanders in the last two months have contributed to our campaign for Congress because they believe that I'm best suited to deliver results for working people in Rhode Island from Washington. Um, but that being said, I strongly support campaign finance reform, and I will be an advocate for that in Congress. We need to repeal the disastrous Citizens United decision that opened the door to unlimited dark money in elections. We need to tighten campaign finance laws, and that is something that I'll advocate for in Congress. You're a Democrat. You were, I think you were on the Common Cause board uh, before mm -hmm. you were treasurer. Do you feel uneasy at all that you're basically pushing other people out of the race with money. Well, the reality is that the Republicans have put this race on their target list. The RNC is going to be investing big money trying to elect Alan Fung or some other right-wing Republicans so that they can take control of Congress and turn back the clock on things like health care and women's rights and workers' rights. And we need to have a strong campaign on the Democratic side 
to keep this seat in Democratic hands. It's vitally important that we do that. At the same time, yes, when I get to Washington, I will be fighting for campaign finance reform um, across the board. Uh, but we know that campaign finance reform is never going to happen if the Republicans take control of Congress because they have consistently opposed those, message, uh, those uh, measures. We talk about gas prices. Yeah. They're high, as you know, uh, and there's a lot of talk about suspending the gas tax should the state and or the federal government suspend the gas tax? Well, I've already called for the federal government to do so, and I think Congress should act on that. Um, people are having a hard time keeping up with the cost of living, right? Inflation is 7.5% over the last year. The cost of gas has gone up 80 cents in just the last month. That's unprecedented, and people are having a hard time keeping up. Uh, I've called for suspending the federal gas what tax. What about state? Well, so here's the thing. I believe that you have to say how you're going to pay for it. So when you suspend the federal gas tax, which I support, uh, to give people relief, which suspending the federal gas tax would save the average Rhode Islander three to four dollars every time they fill up their tank. That's a meaningful amount. Um, the gas tax right now pays for critical infrastructure projects that create jobs and support our economy. What I have proposed is suspend the federal gas tax to give people relief, pay for it by instituting a 15 percent corporate minimum tax, which would raise a comparable amount of revenue close the loopholes that allow the biggest corporations to shift their profits overseas, have a 15% corporate minimum tax. That's something that can pass Congress. Senator Manchin has said that he supports the 15% minimum tax. And that's how I would backfill uh, the cost of suspending the gas tax, which would provide meaningful relief to Rhode Islanders. But as treasurer, it sounds like you're a little, little cool to the idea of doing the state gas tax. Uh, you know, I think it's worth looking at, but there has to be a plan for how to pay for it so that these vital projects to fix roads and bridges don't grind to a halt. Let's stick with inflation. You're the yeah. state treasurer. You follow the markets closely. As you said, inflation, it's way, way higher than, than uh, mm -hmm. private sector forecasters expected, than the Fed expected. We're now looking at a lot of interest rates hike this year. In retrospect, did Democrats overshoot by making the American Rescue Plan $1.9 trillion? Well, we needed economic stimulus to get out of the recession caused by COVID-19. There's no question about that. And so I, I think it's a good thing that Democrats acted boldly to rescue the economy and get us out of the pandemic. Um, but we have to be serious about combating inflation. So things that Congress can and should do, suspend the federal gas tax, uh, further utilize the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which still has half a billion barrels of oil that could be used to help lower the cost of gas. Um, do things like give uh, Medicare and Medicaid the ability to negotiate with the, uh, with the drug companies to lower health care costs for all Americans, including here in Rhode Island. But did your, party, can take did your party fundamentally screw up the macroeconomic management of the country while having full control of no. Washington? We now have this big inflation we didn't have a few years ago. We are putting forward, the Democratic Party and myself, we are putting forward proposals to help people keep up with the cost of living, to lower the cost of prescription drugs, to lower the cost of gas, to lower the cost of uh, goods across the economy, and right now it's Republican obstruction that's holding that up. I know we'll, we'll go back to the Congress race in a second. I just, just want to ask you briefly in your yeah. current job as treasurer, what concerns are there when inflation takes off like this uh, for the pension fund? Well, so the pension fund is doing well. We ended 2021 at an all-time high, $10.7 billion. Uh, we outperformed the median, we outperformed 92% of public pension funds across the country last year. So not only did we benefit from the rising stock market, we outperformed the vast majority of our peers. Um, we do have a portion of the pension fund allocated to investments that are um, designed to perform well in an inflationary environment. So I'm confident that we'll come through this in a good condition um, because of those smart investments that we've made. With the nomination hearings of Kitanji Brown Jackson, talk of court packing or expanding the number of Supreme Court justices from its current nine as front and center again, would you support or oppose expanding the U.S. Supreme Court? I think it's something that's worth looking at. The most important thing is the court cannot continue to be so political. Um, you know, it has turned into a process every time there's a vacancy in the court where you know, senators who are looking to, you know, maybe run for president or get themselves on TV, turn it into a political circus, and that is wrong. Um, we need to get serious about measures that will help uh, uh, get past Republican obstructionism. Um, I don't know if expanding the size of the court is the right approach or not, but look, if, if the Republicans in Congress uh, continue to be obstructionists and block qualified people from getting to the bench at all levels, then we have to look at options for reform. 
Um, one of your Democratic opponents, Michael Neary, has been criticizing you over the roughly $800,000 you loaned your campaign for treasurer in 2014. The last time I asked you about this, you said you came from a well-off family and that had let you put personal money into the race. But I did look back. Your tax return for 2014 only showed $5,000 mm -hmm. of income that year. Where did you get $800,000 so quickly when you ha you personally had basically no income and yeah. the money had to come from you, not yeah. somebody else? So, so again, I've answered this question a number of times. I come from a well-off family. Just like many other people who've run for office before, that gave me the ability to put uh, a personal loan into a race for treasurer eight years ago. There are all kinds of ways that families are able to do that, um, the annual gift tax exemption and things like that. Um, but this is something that is not unusual. Many candidates do it. And I think what most Rhode Islanders are focused on is not that. What they're focused on is who is going to be the best person in Congress to deliver results for them. What I've shown in my time as state treasurer is that I can deliver results for working people Did in Rhode Island. Did you get the money that year? Did you already have it? Uh, over this series of a number of years. I mean, again, it's, it's no secret that I come from a well-off family, just like many other people who've run for office and who hold office in Rhode Island currently. And, you know, that's, that's why I was able to do that eight years ago. Treasurer, your campaign website for Congress is absolutely devoid of any policy statements, mm -hmm. and uh, people going there to learn about you will have um, little idea of where you stand. So I want to do a rapid-fire section here. Uh, mm -hmm. We do this uh, with, with candidates. I'm looking for one two-word answer uh, on these next five questions. Are you pro-choice or pro-life? Pro-choice. Do you support uh, or oppose legalized recreational marijuana on the federal level? Yes. Uh, federal ban on what have been labeled assault-style rifles like the AR-15. Do you support or oppose that? Uh, absolutely support. W would you vote for Nancy Pelosi as House Speaker again? Yes. And I'll let you expand on this one. Some Democrats want to, uh, to raise the income tax on the wealthiest Americans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, look, I think it's unconscionable that you know people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk um, are paying a lower tax rate than many working Rhode Islanders. And so uh, I do think that we need to have a federal tax policy where the wealthy pay their fair share. We need to close What is that loopholes. income level, household income level? Well, I don't think we should raise taxes on any family making less than $400,000 a year. Um, and above that, though, I do think that the wealthiest need to pay their fair share. And we need to close the loopholes that allow the wealthiest people to dodge their taxes. Um, Senator Joe Manchin, you mentioned him earlier, he's signaling he might be open to reopening talks on the Build Back Better bill if yeah. it's narrowly focused on climate change, prescription drug costs, and reducing the deficit. That would leave a lot out that progressives wanted. We only have about a minute left, but uh, would you vote for a slimmed down bill like that if you were in Congress, or would you hold out for the original big Build yeah. Back Better bill? So the priorities for me, the things that I would push for, um, lowering the cost of, the cost of prescription drugs. Um, so I'm glad to hear that Senator Manchin is willing to consider that, because that has to be a priority. Uh, making child care more affordable and universal pre-K would also be high priorities for me. Those are the things that I would advocate for. Um, but we, you know, we have to get the strongest possible package that's feasible to get through Congress because people are counting on us to help them keep up with the cost of living and produce real results. So if you were in Congress, you would not be in that block of progressives who won't let a bill go through yeah. unless it's the original bill it, BBB. You know, in a, in a democracy, you cannot always get away with an all or nothing approach, but I would advocate for a strong package that in particular had uh, measures to lower the cost of prescription drugs, expand access to child care and pre-K, and uh, make important investments in transitioning to a clean energy economy. Those are the priorities that I would fight for. Uh, final question to you. Do you commit to debating your opponents both in the primary and the general election here on Channel 12? I look forward to it. All right. We'll hold you to yeah. that one. Uh, Treasurer, thank you so much for joining us on the All program. Right. And when we come back, my one-on-one -on -one interview with outgoing state police colonel James Manny. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. Colonel James Manny of the State Police is set to retire at the end of April after he was offered and accepted the job as town manager in South Kingstown. Manny has been superintendent of the State Police for just over three years and it has been a turbulent three years with civil unrest and of course a global pandemic. On Wednesday, I sat down with Manny at the State Police headquarters in the Colonel Walter Stone conference room to talk to him about what he views as his legacy at the helm of the storied agency. Uh, Colonel, thanks for taking the time and congratulations on the new job. Thank you. So I went back and I rewatched our interview from three years ago when you were sworn in as Colonel of this uh, agency. And one of my last questions to you was, how long do you see yourself as Colonel of the State Police? And your answer was, 
I'd like to be here for a long time, as long as I'm welcome. I'm curious if you find three years to be a long time and if you still feel welcome. Well, I definitely feel welcome. So that's not what this is about. Um, as long as, as looking back at three years, I would have liked to stay four to five years at, at, you know, at a minimum. Um, but looking at what the past two years have been like, I, I think we could all agree that accelerates everything. It's been a very, it's been a very challenging time for the past two years. We had no idea what was coming. No, we didn't. When we my, sat here three years. My ago. eyes were wide open in that interview. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the answer. But there's another point to this. I I was not looking to leave the Rhode Island State Police, and I I did know that. I, but I did know that I, I loved being a town manager in Narragansett. I loved that role that I played there. And I knew when the day came when I left uh, this position, I would like to go back to be a town manager somewhere. So about uh, a month ago, the position in South Kingstown opened where they were taking applications, and I fought long and hard about it. So to, to have the ability to interview for a position that I truly loved, a town manager's position, in the town I live in was, was something that I really had to think long and hard about, and I ultimately decided I would apply for it. Ten years from now, when you think about back at your tenure as colonel, what memory is going to stand out to you most? Well, the opportunity to have this title was going to stand out the most, that I feel like one of the luckiest people around, to, that I was able to not only attain my dream of being a trooper, but by being named as a superintendent. I used this as an example the other day. I truly feel like I climbed Mount Everest. I got to peek out over the top, and then and I'll be able to climb down. Um, but what, what, what will I remember, is your question? What the yep. things I remember the most? There are certain things that I'll never forget. Most of them happened within this two-year two period, not the three-year period. Mm. One was uh, very early on in the pandemic, when we had an executive order from the governor to um, restrict access to the state from other states and and find out where people were going to be going and so forth. But once again, these models showed other states were getting hit extremely hard before we did and that they might try to get to other states for their health care, their supermarkets and so forth. And your troopers were conducting highway stops from that's people right. out of state. That's right. And pretty, when you think about it, it's pretty wild. It was. And that was at, at the time was very controversial. and. Uh, I know it made the national news. So we had we were diverting traffic with thousands of vehicles crossing the state line down Hope Valley, especially coming from uh, the south. And I drove down there quite a bit to see it firsthand. And I'll never forget driving that stretch of highway from exit three to exit two, southbound, and then vice versa, northbound, and not seeing one vehicle on the road, not one. And I've driven that roadway thousands of times in my career because I was stationed out of that barracks. And not to see a vehicle on the highway was an eerie feeling, almost surreal. Like, what exactly is going on here? Mm. And then stopping at these rest areas and seeing National Guard soldiers and state troopers, you know, uh, doing contact tracing and, and providing information to the motorists. People, people were legitimately scared those first few weeks when all this was going on. I have to imagine another <clears throat> memory for you that's going to stick out is uh, the June 2020 riots in Providence, which, in which your agency had to assist. And I know you were there. Yes, I, I'm sure those images are uh, forever in your head. That one is that one is definitely forever in my head. Uh, June 1st of 2020, we had seen a lot of civil unrest across the United States because of the George Floyd death, the incident that occurred. And a lot of it was directed at law enforcement. And I often wondered, because we had a great relationship with our residents, could this come to Rhode Island? Could this feeling come to Rhode Island? And, and it did. And June 1st, uh, well, let me back up. The day before, Boston had had a very large gathering. Some of it turned. Uh, I don't know if the word was riot up there, but it, it became very disruptive. And they had 500 state troopers have to go up there and handle that. But we don't have 500 troopers. We had 250 troopers in the entire state. So I wondered, okay, if something like that happens here, how are we gonna handle this? Well, was, immediately we, had, we would have to call it the National Guard. So, but I remember 
going to the state house, getting intelligence from another law enforcement agency that they were following numerous vehicles heading to this state. And they were concerned that one of the malls was going to be looted. That's what came to me at about quarter of nine on that night. I immediately called the governor, made her aware of my concerns, and rallied uh, about 60 state troopers to be stationed in and around Providence. And sure enough, about 11 o'clock, it happened. Many people came, some from out of state, and it started out as a protest and quickly turned to very disruptive behavior, eventually into a riot. I just want to stop you here because there has been some disagreement with you on that intelligence. I, I think you're aware of that. I mean, uh, Commissioner Perry um, has said that that intelligence turned out to be wrong, that this was not an out-of-state action. This was driven largely by, and the arrests bear this out, people within Rhode Island. So do you still feel confident in that intelligence you had at the time? I'm, I'm very respectful of Commissioner Perry, mm -hmm. and we've talked about it at length. I think there's, there's truth to both sides of this. The okay. people that were arrested were people from within the state. The agitators came from out of state, you many believe, of them. You believe that? Oh, I know that. You do? I do. Okay. I saw it with my own eyes. All I right. saw the vehicles with out of state plates. I, uh, the intelligence I got was spot on from another law enforcement agency. So I think there were some people coming into the state on, on all these events that were agitators, coming in, mixing it up, and then getting out of the state. And I think, you know, social media played a big role in this, and a lot of the people that showed up that night were Rhode Islanders that were watching social media and showed up for the event. Just prior to the police car burning that night, I was at the State House coming in from Francis Street, and I could see many, several of these vehicles getting onto the highway. They made contact with me and others, and, uh, and and, and took off out of state. So I think some people came, mixed it up, did what they wanted to do, and then left very soon thereafter. You know, and either way, they did do what you said um, was you were getting from another agency, which was getting Well, I will say this. The intelligence I got that night was spot on. I was told it would happen at 11 o'clock, and it occurred right at 11 o'clock. So I know the intelligence I got was correct. So it does beg the question then, was there a law enforcement failure if the intelligence was so strong, turned out to be so true, yet it happened anyway. No, I disagree. It was a law enforcement success. How so? Because we mitigated what could have been much more damage down there. So there were 60 state troopers there, approximately, waiting in Providence somewhere. There were numerous Providence police officers waiting in Providence. We, we made notice to them of what could happen long before it occurred. And also, by the way, at 5 o'clock, a message was intercepted by the Fusion Center of a picture predicting what would happen that night. So we had the picture. We had intelligence, true and accurate intelligence, that was coming in at 9 o'clock, and also the time it would occur. All three things lined up. So you can't look the other way at that. Mm. It, so we had a large law enforcement presence that night, and I truly feel that the men and women of the state police and the Providence police prevented large-scale destruction in the city that night. A lot of talk on who might replace you. Who is your recommendation? I've had numerous meetings with the governor on a transition plan, and I've had a transition plan from day one, which every leader should have, is who's going to take their place in the event someone drops dead, someone, you know, retires, leaves, forced out, whatever. You need a transition plan. and. Um, I've had numerous conversations with the governor about it, and those are private conversations, and I, I really can't say any more than that. All right, then uh, to whoever it is, uh, whoever is the next colonel or superintendent, what is your advice to them? Well, my advice to them is this. Be fair and equitable with everyone. There's one right answer. I have this moral compass that sits on my desk, and it's in my pocket. My wife thinks it's corny, but I, I, brought it to, I brought it to show you. So it sits on my desk, and sometimes when you're going to make these real tough decisions, you look down at it, and you know the needle never moves. It's always facing north. So no matter how you turn it, it's facing the right way. 
And um, my wife laughs about it because she gave me the compass and, uh, and not knowing what I'd do with it. But, uh, but that, is, that is my advice to anyone. The right decision has to be made. Take all the other variables out of it. And there's really only one right answer to any question you have. Follow the truth. That's right. Follow the truth, fair and equitably. And sure, there's going to be people that don't agree with you. And sure, there's going to be people that are disappointed. But you can sleep at night knowing you made the right decision. It's fair and equitable. Our thanks to Colonel James Manny and our first half guest, congressional candidate and general treasurer Seth Magaziner. If you missed any of it, it's on WPRI.com. You can watch it there or you can listen to it through the Newsmakers podcast. I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.